This shape is called a parallelopiped. It's essentially the three-dimensional equivalent of a parallelogram. So you can think of a cuboid and then distorting it in various different directions. Every face is a parallelogram. And hopefully you notice something about the dotted lines I've put in between. The diagonals of the parallelogram appear to cross. And that's the type of problem we're going to be looking at and investigating today. We're going to start by working with this particular parallelopiped. If you look closely, you'll see the labels on each of the corners. We are going to try to demonstrate that the diagonals that we see in dotted lines not only intersect one another, but bisect one another. To prove that they intersect, it's necessary to show that there is a point which is on both diagonals. That's the definition of the two diagonals crossing each other. To prove that they bisect is a stronger condition. We're going to need to demonstrate that that point of intersection is halfway along each of the diagonals. And it turns out that happens at the same time as the other proof. So we get two for one, basically. Here's how we begin. Start by identifying the vectors that correspond to the diagonals OE and BF. So I'm imagining a vector that takes me from O, the origin, to E. That's the diagonal that goes from the front left bottom corner in our picture to the top right back corner. And then BF goes from the front bottom right corner to the top left back corner. The next thing we need to do as soon as we recognize which the two vectors are that we're interested in is find a way to describe any point on the line OE. Now if we were dealing with Cartesian equations we would describe a general point on a line by putting an equation together involving its x and y coordinates and in theory you could do that in 3D with x, y and z coordinates but there's a more elegant approach to this and we use vectors to do it. Any point that lies along a particular line can be thought of as a certain multiple of a vector added to the starting point of that line. So if you imagine starting at O, for instance, and heading in the direction of E, if you are only allowed to move in the direction of E, in other words, parallel to the vector OE, then you will only ever move along the line at OE. And in theory, you could go beyond E if you moved a, a multiple that was greater than one times the vector OE, or you could go backwards if you moved a negative multiple of OE. But if you stick with a multiple between 0 and 1, then you should stay between O and E. And that's what this does for us. Don't be scared off by the use of lambda. It's traditional when we're dealing with vectors to use lambda and mu if we have scalar quantities that we want to incorporate. You can use K or something if you prefer. So if the vector OE is given by 4, 2, 3, which we can see directly from the information we were given about the coordinates over here, OE just means the position vector of the point E, but it's also how we get from the point O to the point E. So that's 4, 2, 3. And if we have a multiple of 4, 2, 3, 4, 2, 3 multiplied by some scalar quantity, we will generate for ourselves a vector which is parallel to the vector 4, 2, 3. So think of it as an arrow that points from O in the direction of E, but we can vary its length. Really important idea here. If we have lambda equals 0, this vector is just the same as the 0 vector, 0, 0, 0. And if we make lambda equal to 1, we get 4, 2, 3. That's the point E. If you make lambda equal to something else, you get something in between. So if lambda equals 0.1, we get 0 0.4, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, which is exactly a tenth of the way along the line from O to E. The next step turns out to be a little more complicated, but it uses exactly the same idea. We need to find a way to describe any point on the line BF. We're going to give this one the label M, so we can refer to it more easily. And it's important to notice here that a point on the line BF doesn't start from the origin. It starts from V. So it looks more like a combination of a vector that takes you to B and a vector that takes you from B towards F. We're going to start, therefore, by identifying the vector BF, which is our diagonal. 
and we get BF by doing OF minus OB, the position vector of the final point, the end point, minus the position vector of the initial point, the starting point. That gives us the vector minus 2, 2, 3. And that we should be able to verify reasonably well from the diagram. That's how you would get from B to F. Negative 2 in the x direction, 2 in the y direction, and 3 in the z direction. On our diagram, the x direction is in red, the y direction is in blue, uh, sorry, green, and the z direction is in blue. Once we have the vector BF, we can generate the vector BM in the same way that we did with the vector ON. So BM is some multiple of the vector BF. It will take us some portion of the way from B to F. And if you try putting values for mu into that, you'll see that we can get anything from 0 up to minus 2, 2, 3. But remember, the 0, 0, 0 vector that we end up with there is... the vector that doesn't take you anywhere from B. So it's a little different to a vector that leaves you at the origin. It's a vector that starts at B and heads towards M. In order to construct the position vector of M, we need to find OM. That's a vector that takes you from O all the way to M. To do that, we combine it with a vector OB. So head to B from the origin, and then when you're at B, move towards F. We get to B by following the vector 300. We move towards F by adding some multiple of minus 2, 2, 3. And that will give us a vector to start with, so sort of an initial position vector OB. That's the beginning part of this expression. And then this second part involving mu, this will take us some portion of the way from B to F. And notice here, again, we can test this out. If mu equals 0, we get 3, 0, 0, which is the point B. And if mu equals 1, then we get 1, 2, 3, which is the point F. So varying the value of mu from 0 to 1 will perfectly move us from the point B to the point F. Next, we know now that the position vector of any point on the line OE can be written as 4 lambda, 2 lambda, 3 lambda, and any point on BF can be written as 3 minus 2 mu, 2 mu, 3 mu. Now that's any and every point on those two diagonals. We've now found a way to uniquely describe. The really clever bit comes next. We set them equal to each other. We want to know if there are any points where the two cross. And the great thing here is, if we set them equal to each other and we find a contradiction, that just tells us they don't cross. It's just like trying to solve simultaneous equations and finding no solutions. That tells you that there are no points that are on both lines. And that can happen quite often, particularly with 3D shapes. If you have two random lines in three dimensions, they probably won't cross because there's so much flexibility in terms of where they can go and where they can be. Um, but if we set them equal to each other and we don't find a contradiction, we find some valid values of lambda and mu that make them work, then what that means is here's a value of lambda and here's a value of mu for which these points are the same point. And that's what we do. Remember, for two vectors to be equal, all their components have to match. The i component for lambda must be identical to the i component of the other vector, 3 minus 2 mu, and so on. So for a single vector equation in three dimensions, we end up effectively with three different linear equations in this case. They're simultaneous equations, but there are three of them. And yet we only have two unknowns. So you could argue this is overkill. What this is showing us is there are more ways for this to go wrong in three dimensions, more ways for us to discover that the lines don't cross. Because chances are there'll be solutions to any two of these equations but unless there is some particular reason for the two lines to actually intersect, there will be some contradiction somewhere. Well, the second and third equations tell us straight away that lambda and mu must be equal. So I'm going to use that idea and I'm going to substitute that into the first equation because that looks more complicated. And that tells me that 4 lambda is equal to 3 minus 2 lambda because lambda and mu are the same. 
and therefore we can find a value for lambda. And if we know that lambda is a half, that means that mu is also a half. Now, the fact that they are a half isn't the most important thing. The fact that there is a consistent value, there is a value for lambda and a value for mu for which these vectors are the same, that's what counts. And you can test this, and I would highly recommend you do so. You take your lambda equals a half, and you plug it right back into this one, and we'll find we get the point 2, 1, 1 and a half. If you do the same with mu equals a half into this, we should also get 2, 1, 1 and a half. In other words, if you go halfway along the journey from O to E, you will get to the point 2, 1, 1 and a half. And if you go halfway along the journey from B to F, you will also reach the point 2, 1, 1 and a half. So there is a point that's on both lines. This is the key idea here. Since there are values, lambda and mu, for which on equals om, they cross. In other words, n and m are the same point. Moreover, because lambda is 0 0.5, the crossing point is halfway from O to E. And for the same reason, mu is 0 0.5, so the crossing point is halfway from B to F. The intersection point is also a bisection point. It cuts each of the two diagonals exactly in half. And that's what we were asked to prove. This next example may look more daunting, but actually it's a little bit quicker. And that's because we're working with a more abstract version. I think it's really important to see how it works with coordinates first. But once you've got that clear in your head, come back to this and see what happens when we have a, b, and c. Each of these vectors could represent the kind of vectors we were looking at before, 1, 0, 4, 2, 2, 7, whatever they might be. But each one is a three-dimensional vector and they're pointing in different directions. So we can use them to define this parallel pipette. In order to prove that the diagonals intersect, regardless of the vectors a, b, and c, we need to construct, like we did before, the vectors that represent the diagonals. So think carefully about this. If we start from the bottom left front corner, the one that all the arrows are coming out from in my diagram, then the diagonal from this corner to the opposite corner is going to be a vector that takes us from 0 a's, 0 b's and 0 c's all the way to 1 a, 1 b and 1 c. So you'd need to move 1 in the direction of the vector a, 1 of the vector b and one of the vector c in order to get to the top right back corner and you can do that by following the vector a plus b plus c that's how you get from the front left bottom corner to the top right back corner the next one is a little more complicated we use for this one i'm going to use the diagonal that takes us from the front right bottom corner to the back left top corner so that one needs to take us from 1a plus 0b plus 0c to the point 0a plus 1b plus 1c and we can get from one to the other by following this vector negative a plus b plus c remember that's how it, we take ourselves from the front right bottom corner to the top left back corner and now we get the general points. The general point on the first diagonal means some point along the line from the bottom left front corner to the top right back corner. And that is given by just some multiple of that vector, a plus b plus c. The second one, we start by following the vector a to take us initially to the corner we want to start from. And then we go some multiple of the vector in the direction of that top left back corner, which is negative a plus b plus c. And then we equate them. And you can see there are fewer awkward numbers kicking around here. So in some sense, it's easier. But of course, it's more abstract and it can be harder to get your head around. We have lambda times a on the left hand side and we have one minus mu times a on the right hand side, which means lambda and one minus mu have to be equal. But then from the B and C terms, we can equate those as well. The reason we can do that is that A, B and C are not parallel vectors. None of them are parallel to any of the others, which means that we can treat them in the same way that we treat the separate components when we have coordinates given, like the I and J and K components can be treated separately. Provided the vectors cannot be constructed from one another, 
that you can't ever move in the direction of A if all you have at your disposal are B and C vectors. You can only ever move within the plane that B and C describe. So if you've got some motion in the direction of B on the left-hand side of the equation, then that has to correspond perfectly to this, the motion in the direction of B on the right-hand side. Therefore, lambda and mu have to be equal in order to make the B components match. And lambda and mu have to be equal to make the C components match. But that's okay, that's consistent. So far, so good. We're showing that lambda and mu have to be the same. And when we incorporate the first part from looking at the A components, if lambda has to be 1 minus mu, but also lambda and mu are equal, then it's a simple matter to substitute in, rearrange, solve. And we end up proving that, firstly, the diagonals intersect, which is what we were asked to demonstrate. But secondly, as we saw before, because lambda and mu both give us this value of 0.5, the diagonals don't just intersect, they bisect one another.